Hi, I'm uh, Serge Massis. Um, I'm here to present on the subject of lip reading with AI, um, something called assistive augmentation. Um, so uh, let's first get started quickly introducing myself. Um, I'm a graduate student at Illinois Tech. Anybody from Chicago in the house? Show of hands, cool. Um, I'm a data scientist at Form Labs. Um, it's a 3D printing manufacturer. Um, anybody toy around with 3D printing here? Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, and actually uh, for over 10 years I, I was a web developer and a webmaster and I managed three, uh, you know, web projects. Any web developers here? <laughs> yeah. I thought so. Um, I forgot to ask, but can you hear me well? Everybody? Cool? Okay. Uh, I ask, what if you couldn't hear me at all? You know, what if it was hard for you to hear even at close pro proximity? Um, it's actually a more common problem than you would think. Um, uh, there's actually something called, uh, you know, uh, the Americans with Disability Act has been, uh, it was passed in 1990 and, uh, you know, it prohibits discrimination based, uh, you know, it, it makes sure that there's reasonable accommodation for all persons with disability. Uh, despite of it, uh, there are many areas in which there aren't reasonable accommodations. Uh, you know, live speaking events like this one, but there is, you know, but sometimes, you know, quite often it's not the case. You know, conferences, meetups, lessons, lectures, uh, you got to think, what if in, you're, you're like at a train station or airport, you know, and, you know, there's a public announcement. How can you tell if you can't hear? You know, usually there's, there's speakers for that. There's a PA system or a GA system. And, uh, and theatrical events, they, they lack captioning at all. Uh, for the most part, unless it's a, a foreign film. Um, so uh, there's a lot of cases in which reasonable accommodations for the deaf and hard of hearing aren't covered, at least proactively. Uh, and even if they were covered, there's a lot of common issues that, you know, deaf and uh, hard of hearing people have. Uh, you know, they, they have simply daily interactions cause, you know, like that they have to have some kind of verbal response uh, unexpectedly, you know, like say they're at the supermarket and, uh, you know, the, the cashier tells them something, they have no idea what they said. Um, so the, the core issue, it's, it's an invisible uh, disability. There's uh, 10 million people that have some form of from moderate to complete uh, Profo uh, hearing, profound hearing loss. And this is three times as many people that have uh, the iconic disability, which is, you know, having uh, a wheelchair or a, a cane. And uh, since it's not immediately apparent, uh, you know, this causes, you know, a lot of lack of awareness, misconceptions, and the policies and regulations surrounding it, uh, you know, don't, don't cover a lot of things, don't make sure that there, 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 there exists a, a reasonable accommodation and reasonable interactions with uh, people with this sort of disability. In addition to the lack of visibility, there's a number of misconceptions. And some of them is that all deaf people sign, and this is very wrong. Um, they, they all read lips, which is very, very difficult. In fact, uh, you know, even professionals only are able to detect up to 15% of what is said through that method. And uh, you know, that hearing aids fixed deafness, that they're the equivalent of eyeglasses, and they're not. So let's talk about solutions, how to solve the previously mentioned problems with assistive technologies. And let's examine what I mean by assistive technologies. So these are assistive technologies you might have seen before. Uh, a braille reader for the blind, a caption telephone for the deaf, 
and a mouse stick for the quadriplegic. Um, they're, they're very helpful, they're very useful, uh, but they, they also have their limitations. Assistive augmentation, on the other hand, it goes a step further in trying to help people you know, work around their challenges and allow for seamless and enhanced interaction. Uh, and some of them, like the finger reader, you just point at something and it reads it to you. Uh, an augmented reality headset, uh, which allows anybody that doesn't have super human uh, motor skills do very, very precise things. Like, for instance, uh, a surgeon, you know, know exactly the distance between two points or, you know, something of that, to that effect. Um, the, you know, also there's a chewable pointer for a quadriplegic person to actually, you know, uh, be able to point to something with a mouth without having to use a, a mouse stick. Uh, a lot of these things can help able-bodied people as well. So, like, that's, that's the sense of it. You know, you, like, for instance, there's even exoskeletons that could help an able-bodied person, you know, with very little elf effort, you know, pick up things, etc. So, and that could help someone disabled as well. So, assistive augmentation is about enhancement and seamless enhancement. And there's a number of old school solutions for the deaf and hard of hearing. There's speech recognition, uh, which lacks immersion and doesn't work in noisy environments. There are video relay ser services, which relies on other humans to, to interpret an interface. And there's closed captioning for services, which, of course, I, I had uh, written this before I came to this conference. I, mentioned, I was referring to automated closed captioning searches, because it, live, it's not usually sloppy and tone deaf. <laughs> so I apologize for that. I'm sure she's doing a fantastic job. <laughs> so um, recent improvements and technologies and their costs uh, you know, have uh, going down have allowed for even better technologies. Uh, assistive augmentation solutions. And for instance, we have smart caption glasses here uh, that allows people to seamlessly follow the performance in a, an, a theatrical event in London. Uh, we have a, a special hardness for the deaf to feel music during a concert, which is also very helpful to be able to engage that kind of uh, environment. And then there's an assisted li listening system, which, which allows for a person to, you know, with moderate hearing loss, to actually enjoy an event when they're farther away. And this is, no, this is not even a high-tech solution, but, it, you know, given that there's a lot of the people that have moderate hearing loss are elderly, you know, uh, that's what's made this issue more visible and allowed for things like this. So, uh, a steam collaborator, a collaborator and I um, from school, we, we, start, we, we set out to attempt to solve this problem using our own tool set, uh, which is uh, machine learning. But uh, knowing what we knew about the end user after all this research, uh, it was, you know, we figured we, we had to come up with an assistive augmentation solution so that it, it comprehensively solved it. So say if we wanted to uh, help a, a deaf or hard of hearing person understand this presentation without, you know, and say it was all spontaneous and there wasn't uh, a closed captioner, um, what would we have to do? We would have to come up with something accessible that was inexpensive and easy to use, uh, immersive, so it didn't distract too much from the understanding and enjoyment, and, and also, uh, contextual and verbal, and by that I mean it was easy to identify the context to a certain degree, and also it also included some paraverbal elements. And I'll get into more of that later, um, but these are just basics. And then uh, accurate and noise invariant, and uh, noise wouldn't affect it. Like say if there was a spontaneous laughter and I was still talking, they would be able to still understand what I was saying. So 
like we, we came up with, you know, drew up something that would be like the ideal solution. And this is what we thought, you know. Uh, you know, just pull up a phone or a tablet, point it at the speaker. Of course, be close enough for that to actually <laughs> work. And, uh, and then it's, it's immersive because you just point at it and they're able to see the text underneath. It's accessible because it's a phone or a tablet and they're reasonably cheap and it's not a special device they have to get just for that. And, uh, you know, and, and also uh, it has parallel components and by that I mean like if I say this is exciting and I say it with a certain tone, you can tell, you know, by the green. Of course, a language has to be developed to actually do that effectively. And there is nothing like that necessarily that you have in written text the way of doing it other than putting parentheses underneath or, or something to that effect. Um, lastly, there's the, the topic of accuracy and noise invariance. And for that, I'm going to have to speak about machine learning, but I'll, I'll save that for later. Okay, so um, how many of you have uh, trained a machine learning model? Okay, reasonable amount. Um, so I, this is for the rest of them, the rest of us, or not of us, but of you <laughs> um, that haven't. Um, like I, I titled this talk about artificial intelligence because it's a you know, more glitzy term. I personally don't prefer it, but I f figured, well, if I put ML or machine learning, less people would come, you know? <laughs> so um, the thing is, I, this, this solution had to be deep learning, and I'm going to get into it a bit, of, bit more, but machine learning is not more complicated uh, than you would expect. Um, basically, you just tra take a, a, a set of data, feed it to a model, which then learns from it, but it learns only specifically from that data you fed. So it's not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have that capacity inherently to, to learn from anything else other than what you gave it. So let's, let's look at an example. This is the training process. Um, it's obviously an oversimplification, um, but uh, you, know, you just pour data into a big pile of linear algebra and uh, if the answers are wrong, you just stir, stir it again and again until you get right answers. Um, and uh, so I chose deep learning because deep learning can do something a little bit more complex. Let's say you have uh, an image of, of you, you have a dog called Sparky, and you want it to be able to tell if it's, if it's a dog. Obviously, you know it's a dog, but you want to be able to take a picture and say, OK, it's a dog. Um, so you, you take a collection of pictures of dogs versus other things, and you, you put it into a, a network. Uh, so the network, what it does through the magic of linear algebra, it just starts to identify different features from that dog layer after layer after layer, every, every layer more complex than another. So first, it might detect certain you know, edges, then it might detect, you know, uh, you know, a collection of edges, and then bigger features, you know, nose, you know, uh, ears, etc. So then when it combines those features in the last layer, it combines those features together to identify, oh, it's a dog. And, and to be clear, it doesn't, you know, it never tells you, you know, shouldn't, 100% accuracy, it's a dog. It'll tell you like, oh, 0.85% accuracy, it's a dog. So, you know, you kind of round it up in comparison to all the other ones to determine that it is indeed a dog. So, now going back to the topic of, of lip reading, uh, why do lip reading at all? And in other words, what does it have to do with speech recognition? Well, when I say speech recognition, recognition, you might imagine, you know, uh, basically you just need a microphone, just like you just need an ear to understand what I'm saying. But if we put it in the context of human physiology, we realize that, you know, speech is not really unisensory. Uh, there's a lot of instances in which, on other sense, 
you know, enhances your ability to understand. And so th that's, that's one of the things that is kind of missing. You know, when you, you pull out your phone and you, you point it at something that's being said and you say, okay, just tell me what it's being said, you're really using one sense. So ideally, a solution would combine more than one sense so that it becomes really robust. Um, so the, the audio component can age the visual and vice versa. So remember what I said about accuracy and noise invariance. So say you have a video where you have a stream of you know, frames, and in those frames, you have the movement of the mouth. On the other hand, you have the audio basically representing what's being said by that mouth. Uh, combining both, you can achieve greater accuracy and noise invariance simply by the, 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 by the possibility of what I'm going to tell you next. Okay, so lip reading and, and speech recognition alike have uh, a number of challenges. Uh, they're difficult because uh, of homophones and homophones. And uh, so this, is, this is only becomes better. Humans can understand these things because of context uh, and only because of context. So like in, in English, we have all these instances. And so do, so do they exist in other languages, which words sound very alike. And we can only understand them you know, because of the context of them. And this happens visually and also auditorially. So we could hear MIDI and meteor and you know, MIDI reader and mediator. And if these things were said very quickly or with a different accent, it became really hard to understand. So for instance, if uh, the, the, the phrase was Michael colored the bedroom wall with crayons, uh, an example of homophone would be Michael colored the bedroom call wall with crayons. And the only reason we know it's not my call, it's Michael, is context. Or maybe because it was said you know, very clearly and slowly and, and, and in such a way where you understood it's not my call, it's Michael. So the, an example of homophene is Michael colored the bedroom call with crayons. Because if you said these, the, that phrase, call and well, would, would shape the same mouth movement. So how, how to solve this with uh, deep learning? Uh, we use something called long short-term memory. And this is what can take into account the context. So basically, you chain the networks together in such a way where time is taken into account. So, uh, each network is a different time step, and it's learning and progression. So it's, at the same time, learning from the previous time steps, it's also forgetting. And that's why it's called long, short-term memory. Uh, so it, it has a special property. It makes it easier to learn long-term features because of that. Um, So not a single LSTM network is used for this solution. Uh, you have a, a listen module, a watch module, which I've explained, but you also have a spell module. And that's really important. Um, I, will, I will explain that in a little bit more detail later. But uh, the spell module helps decode everything into a final prediction. So it takes, it takes what's coming out of each one. and it's allowing for it to discard any information that isn't useful using their probabilities. And so this allows to figure out in which, parts is to, which parts to focus and which ones to not. So how many of you have ever watched a TED? Almost everybody. <laughs> so like TED Talks, they're very diverse. They're very clear. Um, you know, they're reasonably well lit, um, yet occasionally obfuscated. There's a very diverse set of faces, genders, and ethnicities, facial hair, etc. And it's 
occasionally noisy because of the clapping and you know the laughing, but you know, like there's also a diverse set of voices. You have different accents, tones, etc. So, like, what we did was take uh, a collection of these, 500 hours of tech talks, uh, of which 400 were used for the training, and uh, was ext extracted from YouTube. And this was used for the training. So the, the data set by itself, it's really important to prepare it well so that you, know, you make sure that it's, it's grabbing the right features, you're using the right parts of the data. Uh, when, I, when I said you know, this terrifying looking man is saying always with a smile, so when I said, uh, like, you, you had to learn from different features and you had to learn from the lips, it's important to isolate the lips for the training. So what we did here was take the video and identify the mouth and separate it. And you know, crop it up, put it into a uniform way so that it was always centered on the mouth, always the, the same amount of you know, pixels and everything. Um, and uh, at the same token, we took the audio and we separated and make sure it matched. So this always with a smile video, you, you have, the, you have the, the, the clip, the, the set of frames, and you have the audio. And at the same time, you have also, on the other hand, what it's supposed to say. So it's, it's going to learn from the co combination of these two things against this, predict, this prediction, this, this annotation. So the watch module, the way it works is that you, you feed every time step, you know, five frames at a time into different LSTMs in, in, that are all chained together. Um, and so, but before you even do that, you have to use what I told you about the, you know, remember what I said about the dog, about how to identify if it's a dog or a cat. Basically, it's the same architecture in the beginning. So you're, you're trying to identify the features of the face, well, not of the face, but of the mouth region uh, in the same manner. So it's going through a, a conv what's called a convolutional neural network. So the the convolutional neural network is pretty much the same thing I was talking about with, with the dog uh, in this case. So you're, you're, each one of these is receiving uh, a CNN before it's going into the LSTM. So that way, you're not sending it an entire you know, range of images, but what's getting is a simplified version of it, just a, b a bunch of features for each sequence. And what it's really learning is from that sequence. In the listen module, it's, it doesn't have to do that because audio is far more simple than video. Uh, so it's, it's less complex in nature. It has less dimensions. So, and, and there's already, like, there are already algorithms to actually take audio and put it, take, extract the essence of that audio. And, and one of those algorithms, is, it's called the M M MFCC, the Mel Frequency Substrate Coefficients. And so you just uh, take any audio clip and you can run that and it'll extract the number of features that you need. And so I'm taking an equivalent amount of time, the same amount of uh, time and uh, and taking small clips, like say for every frame, every set of frames I'm sending to the, to the watch module, I'm doing the same with the listen module, but I'm sending like uh, just e the, the equivalent clip, but in audio. So lastly, this, go, this, this goes into the LSTM transducer, which, is, which looks like this, and it has it, it first goes through these and then in what is called an attention module. So the attention module is really important because that's what ultimately determines 
what, what feature is identified and is then processed uh, you know, as into the output of the predictions. So uh, the spell module is what, what takes everything that came before it in the different time steps and identifies what to discard or not. OK, so this project was inspired by uh, Google and DeepMind. Uh, DeepMind is a lab in the UK. Uh, they've been very successful in, in, in deep learning. And uh, a few years ago, they took footage from the BBC and did something like this, uh, but solely on, on lips. And it was quite a feat because, you know, remember that I, I said people, the, even professionals, only achieve, and here it says 12.4% accuracy. And they have achieved nearly four times as much. So uh, that was really, really good. Uh, our training results uh, were better than that, but they weren't near you know, what you would expect in the industry. And that's you know, because the data set was relatively small. It turns out 400, uh, five, yeah, 400 hours is not enough you know, to actually train someone to understand um, an entire language. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's robust when compared to lip reading alone. So, let's see an example of this. Um, you know, this is, I did a Python implementation of, you know, what ideally I would want on a phone. So, you know, you just point the camera on, onto you and you just uh, start talking and it uses both the an isolation of the mouth region plus the sound to understand what you're saying. So here, here I say, can you read my lips? Um, obviously, the, if this were a transcript done by a, a professional closed captioner, it would say, can you read my lips? Question mark. It would understand by the intonation and the context that it was a question. And obviously, it doesn't do this. Um, and then. Uh, I, I guess I, I got really excited, and I, and I, I spoke too quickly, but I, I thought, I said, oh, wow, it does work. But it says, or, wow, does work. So, I, yeah, I got ahead of myself. So, so then to gain insights, to take this project and understand exactly what to do next, it's really important to rely on the, on the test data set. So we, we had holed out, uh, 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 you know, I think about 100 hours worth of uh, test data set so we could tell if it was actually, you know, uh, working in, in unseen data by the model. And so um, let's see a few clips. Okay. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. See, so sometimes it works perfectly. Uh, but the, the difference is the speaker here is talking slowly with clear intonations, no slang, very common accents, uh, words that aren't particularly difficult. And the lips are easy to locate. As you can tell, I have it that isolated. However, in this one, this is actually a combination of three clips that were previously unseen. So I knew I was dealing with a professional. <laughs> the worst should be about 2.5 million. This isn't the first time I've seen a booty in my friend. No, no, no. So this was particularly challenging. Uh, see, there's, there's an accent. It, it, there's, there's different kinds of speed, and the cadence is, is off. Um, it's in particular, the last one, you know, what it predicted is completely off. You know, instead of no, no, no at the end, it's not new, 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 which is not even close. Um, so, and, and sometimes the problem is with the unknown words. 
uh, sometimes, as with people, you, you have to hear a word not even only once. You have to hear it many times before you can understand it in context. And uh, this is an example of that. Efficiency works really well when you can predict exactly what you're going to need. But when the anomalous or unexpected comes along... So here it, it took anomalous and turned it into normal mouse. Um, I don't understand why I would do that, but um, like it just simply, there weren't enough examples with the word anomalous for it to understand it. So even though it was, it was in the training set in other places, it just, it, it thought mouse was more probable. Nope, I didn't build that company. I didn't even start. I was actually a marketing manager for a Fortune 500 company. So this one puzzled me quite a bit because I was like, okay, well, Fortune, he's saying it clearly. It's something that's said a number of times in other clips in similar context. But for some reason, maybe, maybe because it's close to another number, it thought four ton company, 500 company made more sense, you know. I asked myself three things. One, did you mean it? Two, can you defend it? So here, the prediction error, it, you know, if, if I look at this, I think, oh, it's OK. It's doing all right. Obviously, it's, it's counting them as incorrect. But, you know, like lacking the parentheses or some kind of punctuation to make sure, you know, it's a, it, I'm enumerating things, is something more complex than this model was trained to do. So, and again, the question mark, lacking a question mark, is that important, is it not? Um, like, obviously, if you were to try to make this uh, something reliable for assistive augmentation, you have to tackle these problems. But reality is it, it takes for a, a much more complex model to actually do these things and a much larger training set. So if any, any of you have access to thousands of hours of training data, you know, video, annotated video, please let me know. I'd be very interested. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, um, I'm, I'm available. You can reach me through these uh, methods, you know, email or Twitter or, or LinkedIn, or you can ask me now too. Yeah, there's. Yeah, that was done. There's a, uh, there's a machine learning model that you can apply, and it's, you can find it. It's, it's based on some research from uh, a Swedish institute. It's called Kazemi uh, Sullivan. And, and it's, it's very quick at locating facial points. So you can use it to locate points in, in any picture. Once you isolate the face, it will find the points. And using those points, you can def identify the lips. And then what I did there was just, I, I ran it in a Python notebook. It's not that complex. You just, uh, Jupyter notebook, I mean. You just look for those points using that model. And then you establish a margin. And you just crop around that margin. And then if, if say, I want, it has to be a box. So you just make sure it's, it's it's equal dimension, and then you just expand it to meet whatever uh, size you need. In this case, it was like 120 times 120 pixels. So that's what I used. Any questions? Yeah, that's a very good question. He asked if, if I'm trying to add punctuation. And indeed, I am. Um, 
I purposely removed uh, points, final points from the sentence because that's already in the model by a different token. Uh, but like things like comma, like uh, three points, suspension points, uh, and, and um, question marks were tokenized in the hopes that it would find them, but it seldomly did because it's, it's, uh, it's very, usually there isn't like a, a sound or a movement of lips that actually tells the model that's a question. It's learned by context and often it's a context that needs, you know, longer timestamps than the model has been trained to, to include. Like for instance, if, if all, I'm, all I'm doing in those timestamps is like a, a few seconds worth of words, you know, and a sentence is longer than that, it's not, it's not gonna learn from that. So that's, that's a problem. Yes? Oh, the, the inference is, is reasonably quick. I would say it's not super quick, um, but it's, um, it might take, like, uh, it, it, there's a lag time. You, you can't see it by the video, but there's a lag time because uh, it's probably like a, a half a second. Yeah, but uh, the, the training itself took many days. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, ideally, uh, as as you've seen, like uh, cameras, like they're they're becoming more and more megapixels. And there'll be a time where we're talking about 40, 50, I don't know, 100 megapixels. You know, so a lot of things are getting there. Obviously, if you're that far, you'll probably be able to get the sound, but the, the, the movement of the lips will be less discernible at that range. But if you were like in the first few, few rows, it'd be a lot better using the current technology. But in a few years, that could change in just a couple of years. The same goes for inference on the phone. Right now, if I tried to, to run my, my Python script on a phone, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be as, you know, it, there'd be significant lag time, and it might even crash. So the idea is that it would be running offline on the phone and not server. Yes, that would be ideal because, you know, say a person goes underground, you know, to some kind of meetup, you know, in a basement somewhere, um, you know, it's they're going to be connection issues, and uh, even with 5G, uh, you know, the fact that you have to be tethered for something like that uh, is is a problem. Oh. Yeah. To see how it all come together and create just more than we have now for everybody. Yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, what, what you're saying is obviously like models need to be updated. So like just having a model running on your, on your phone and never connecting is, is not a good idea either. Uh, at some point it has to connect. And, uh, but ideally there's like a hybrid solution where you're like for things like this, like because of the possibilities of be able to have inference on your phone in real time, you wouldn't want to, you know, uh, you wouldn't want to restrict it with that, you know, say there was an emergency and they had to understand what a paramedic was saying. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure.
All right. Thank you.